is the no Thursday uh, morning meeting of the House Appropriations Committee. It's September 17. And we are going to start uh, by working on um, our first bill, which is S-352. Uh, we have Representative Kimball here to uh, walk through some of the decisions made by the House Commerce Committee. We also have Ledge Council present and we have uh, JFO present. Welcome, Damien and Chloe. Glad to have you. And we also have Representative Jerome from the committee. You can chime in on this bill, but I know you're doing uh, 353, which we will follow with. So let's jump right into this, Charlie. Um, if you want to do the, are you walking through the bill or would you like Damien to walk through it? Do you have some opening comments? How do you want to, this is, you tell us how you'd like to proceed. Sure, I'd love to provide an opening comment and then let Damien walk through the language as I don't have it uh, on the screen. Damien, is that okay with you? And and acknowledge that Stephanie has the harder of the two bills, so which is wonderful. So uh, S-352, uh, um, this, I believe we're just looking at the amendment coming from me and other members of the Commerce Committee, not an official amendment from the committee because we do not have possession of the bill. Okay. Um, and so we are further providing clarification on the technical amendment to include some people that were not included uh, number one is that traveling nurses that are operating in facilities that are considered to be hazardous. We would wanted those traveling nurses to be included in hazard pay, not excluded from that. Uh, that is the first part. Uh, and that results in some renumbering of the uh, sections of the bill. So you'll see that uh, as Damien goes through it. Uh, the second is that um, the program as it was designed said that employers uh, may identify employees that worked uh, for in a hazardous job, in a job uh, uh, and be eligible for hazardous pay, but they're no longer employed at that employer. Um, so we, we sub substituted the may for a shall uh, saying that we wanted employers to be required to identify employees that had worked in that capacity, uh, but were no longer working there. So they would be eligible for hazardous pay as well, uh, instead of, uh, because we thought there was the opportunity for some employers to say, nah, I don't really want to bother with that. Uh, and then the last real change in this, um, those are really the major changes. Uh, and then it's uh, throughout the rest of the amendment as to how that uh, flows through. And that, that's kind of the introduction as to what we had discussed. Thank you, Charlie. Uh, Charlie, we have possession of this bill now. Did it go to Commerce first? It went to the Commerce, uh, we passed it, and then it was referred to uh, Health and Human Services. Okay, and, and Teresa, we have it now, is that correct? Or does Health and Human Services still have it? That's correct. And I don't, um, Diane, um, I'm seeing online that S353 is still in commerce. Do you know if that was flipped to us? It. I thought, let me look at yesterday's, when they made the motion on the floor yesterday. Both of them came, right? Both of them came to us, both of them. Okay, oh, that's okay. good. So Charlie, when you had the bill, your committee didn't amend it when you had possession of it? We did not. We wanted to uh, facilitate its transfer over to human services. So may have, let me see what, what is yesterday's. Yep. Well, yep. Both, both of them. Thank you, Diane. And, and, Thank you. And the reason why, Madam Chair, is there was a portion on there that they added as an amendment in the Senate, which added $12 million and some clarification around child care, uh, making hazard pay available for child care workers. So and we did not want to. that's why it went to human services. Exactly. Okay, and so Damien, if we pull up the bill, I want to go through more than the amendment because we want to fully understand the 12 million for the child care services too, please. Is Kitty? Yes. I did have a question regarding um, oh, one of I the amendments. I didn't see your hand. Peter, I didn't see your hand. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. It's regarding the traveling nurse uh, piece. Um, as I understand it, and, and Charlie, you can help me uh, better understand this the traveling agencies take a percentage of what the the employee earns right off the top so would the traveling agencies thus keep a percentage of the hazard pay 
that uh, that their employees would be eligible for because it's just more money that, that the employees earning. Uh, thank you, Peter. My understanding of the program um, is similar to how contracted services providing janitorial or food services to, to facilities um, is that we're really talking about direct payment uh, to the employees uh, and that the agencies do not get to keep any of the share of that. Um, so there's no uh, commission off the top, no processing. Um, and we're really talking about not even what the agency may charge for that employee because they may charge $50 when they're only paying them 25. We're talking those eligible employees are based on what they're paid, not on what the agency may be charging. Gotcha, thank you. Thank you, Charlie. Um, David, I see we have just the amendment in front of us, which I would like to walk through, but I think the underlying bill, we need an understanding of the 12 million for childcare and, um, and the position of house human services. Um, yeah, so I can, uh, if you make me a co-host, Teresa, I can go ahead and share that on the screen with everyone. Thank you. Okay. Hey, there you go, Damien. And we Great, have this bill scheduled until 9.45, and then at 9.45 or before, we will pick up S-353. Okay, thank you, uh, Damien. Let's do the bill, and then we'll walk through the amendment. Sounds good. So uh, the bill here, um, the... The, what it did is it basically went back to Act 136 and amended the underlying hazard pay program. So the first change is adding two and a half million dollars to cover the cost of the expanded eligibility through the technical corrections. Um, and then uh, the next change here was uh, with the homeless shelters. Uh, the understanding when it had passed the legislature was that either the words homeless shelter or um, provider of necessities to a disadvantaged population uh, would cover the hotels and motels that were contracting with the state to, to house the homeless. Uh, the agency of human services had a different interpretation. Um, and so uh, we clarified the language in here um, to make it clear to the that that was the intent of the legislature here. Um, so this would just include the lodging establishments um, that provided housing to the homeless pursuant to an agreement with DCF. Okay. The next changes here, um, which Representative Kimball mentioned, were for the contractual cleaning and janitorial services and food service providers that provide um, cleaning or food services to healthcare facilities and residential care facilities. Um, and it's just with respect to the employees in those facilities. Okay. So those were the expansions from the Senate side. Um, the next changes here were on the elevated risk language. Um, on reading through it with fresh eyes after a little time off, I realized that we, frequently referred to members of the public or clients, although we didn't do so consistently, but we didn't refer to patients or residents. Um, and most of the facilities were healthcare or residential care. So that was an omission. So this clarifies that. Uh, to my understanding, this has not affected the eligibility of people in the initial program, but this is more just cleaning it up uh, to make it clear uh, and consistent. One of the things that the Senate also added uh, was the regularly cleaning or sanitizing the premises of a covered employer in a location that is regularly used by individuals who may be infected with, uh, with the virus, but who are known or suspected COVID-19 patients. Uh, and this was felt to be important for um, particularly folks working in a residential care facility where you don't have a known outbreak yet, um, or folks who are working in the hospital and, for example, the emergency room or an urgent care um, facility where people may come in with symptoms and you don't know if they have the virus, 
um, and you don't even know enough to suspect that they have the virus yet. Um, but their the cleaning and janitorial staff are working hard to make sure that if they do, it's not being spread to other people in the facility. Thank you. Okay, are there uh, questions on any of those? Uh, I'm not seeing questions, but then I'm not, uh, let me okay. see if I have any questions yet. I don't have any yet, uh, Damien, so let's continue. Okay. The, the next change here, um, we, have, we have the issue of ongoing community transmission. And this is, this is transmission where there is not a known source uh, for the virus. Vermont was an area with ongoing community transmission for about a month of the eligible period, but we also had facilities that had ongoing community transmission at other points in the period. And we just wanted to, again, make sure that this was covering everyone, um, that you didn't have someone who was inadvertently excluded. There's a lot of overlap between these different requirements for elevated risk. Um, so there's a good chance that if someone qualifies under one, they'll qualify under one or two others as well. I think I might have seen a question. Um, let me see. I, I don't, Mary, do you have your hand up? Is sometimes you can't get yours doesn't go up. I don't see any, Damien. Okay. Great, I, I saw something flash up on my screen momentarily. Um, that was me scratching my nose, I think. That was Katie okay. coming in, Katie McGlynn is here. Oh, okay, great. Um, so uh, the, the next piece with the eligible employee language, this was uh, very much my drafting error. Um, when this bill started, it was a present tense uh, <laughs> pay bill. By the end of June, um, the entire eligible period was behind us, and I forgot to change the language in most of the eligible employee sections to reflect people who were employed during the eligible period. Um, and so instead, it was read as current employees. So what we ended up with is that some individuals who are employed in the eligible period working in one of these jobs, but then jobs or were laid off after the period ended or excluded from receiving the hazard pay um, because they were no longer currently employed by the employer. And we'll get to how we're going to get them grant money uh, in just a few minutes. But that's what these changes do is they open it up to those individuals who, who performed the eligible work during that period, but then mm -hmm. changed jobs or were laid off and so we're no longer uh, directly employed by the employers who are filing for the grants. Okay, so the next change here, um, we've struck out the exclusion for individuals who are independent contractors or self-employed uh, in this section because uh, again, with that issue for individuals who were formerly employed, some of them may now be working uh, as an independent contractor or self-employed. So instead, what we've done is uh, provided that hours of work performed as an independent contractor or sole proprietor don't count towards the award. So, um, yeah, so if, for example, you... Uh, you work as a, um, uh, let's say you work as a nurse for your day job, but then as a part-time side job, you work as an independent contractor providing home care services to people. Um, you could count your, your day job where you're working as a nurse in a healthcare facility, but not the second job where you're working as an independent contractor. Um, so this is just clarifying that that requires here and trying to avoid inadvertently excluding someone who uh, may currently be an independent contractor or may have had a, a second employment as an independent contractor. Does that make sense? So Damien, can you move up a little bit so they were excluded originally from the bill? The they were with the way the language was originally. I'm not sure does it, that this where does it applied. where's the exclusion start? Oh, so okay. it says eligible employee does not include an independent contractor or self-employed individual. Um, 
And now we're just saying an individual who received unemployment insurance benefits during the eligible period. And the reason for the unemployment exclusion was because they, uh, if you received unemployment um, during that period, you were getting the $600 a week enhancement. And so the feeling was that those folks had, had already received additional money. Um, and this was meant to be uh, in part um, uh, a way of showing you know, sort of um, gratitude or something uh, or appreciation for um, folks who stayed on the job in hazardous positions that are not the right. best positions out there. Um, but, but eligible employees, independent contractors who, who fit the, the example that, that, you, that you stated, they would now be eligible. Yes. OK, but, thank you. Uh, Dave? Sorry, just wanted to unmute. Uh, just, I'm on the unemployment piece. Our local hospital laid some people off for one week, one week, and they all went back to work during the duration of the period. So what's the thinking behind that? I hear, I, so they received pay for a week, it was enhanced. They're not gonna collect for that week, but shouldn't they be allowed to collect hazard pay for the rest of the duration? Can the committee so speak to that? Yeah, this, this is really a, a policy call for you. Um, this was a decision that was made in the yes. early on because of concerns about that additional unemployment providing almost a disincentive to continue at work now that we had some good cause quit reasons related to COVID-19 where people could say, um, you know, my kids are out of school, so I'm gonna leave my job and take enhanced unemployment. Um, but this is, now that we're looking back at this with hindsight, this is a policy call for the committee, whether this is still appropriate. Um, so. Did they discuss it, Damien, or did they just? Mm -hmm. this, this was discussed Because it does back. seem, if I meet the hour requirement, I work more than 68 hours, and I'm out for just a short period, doesn't seem uh, fair to me. Is it for bureaucratic reasons? Apparently not. You're saying the committee felt they received an enhancement, thereby they shouldn't receive any additional, regardless how limited the enhancement was. Can, can Charlie speak to this? Yeah, I, I can to the extent that um, I have a comprehension of it, David. And I think the reason why is at the time we were also looking at some of the interpretation as a CRF monies and where we could use them, where we couldn't, where you could have um, a duplication of benefits. Uh, as we look at the business programs, uh, we were considering at the same time whether or not you could receive funds from one uh, grant source and another grant source at the same time. So this was, uh, in, in my memory, maybe Stephanie remembers uh, more, that we were trying to uh, interpret that as to, uh, was somebody double dipping, uh, essentially, into that same pool of funds for mm -hmm. coronavirus relief funds. Uh, and that was really the intent at the time um, not anticipating that someone would be laid off for only one week. Um, so I, I have heard as well as one person being laid off for only one week during that whole period and then not being uh, eligible for any kind of hazard pay because of that. Um, but I don't know, we didn't know how widespread that would be. And I think that's where we had come with that. We did not revisit this particular part in our committee uh, in, the last, in the last month. So we're, we're pretty much. Like, it's in it's in the current language. It's in the current language, yes. Uh, so we did not look, look to amend that. Dave, do you have a follow up question? And could we now, or is it just? What was that, Katie? Were you talking to me? I just said, did you have a follow up, and you're following up? Yes. Yes, thank you. So it sounds like uh, logistically we're in a some kind of a time frame box here. There's no desire to revisit that policy issue. I mean, could we say who has received unemployment benefits for more than four weeks or something like that, just to recognize it? But I'm not gonna I'm not gonna push this at this time any further, other than to 
just wonder, because it wasn't revisited um, since you received it, does it make sense to revisit it again or or am I just uh, am I chasing something that's not not doable? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have Mary and then Chip. Well, I, I think Dave's raising an important question here, and I'm guessing that this is an inadvertent omission, just given the progress of this bill over time. So I'm, I'm not sure we should let go of it, although I am very cognizant of um, time, you know, trading this bill back and forth with the Senate and needing to get it done. But let's don't, let's don't stop thinking about this yet. Um. Just to add some context, the Senate was cognizant of this exclusion both in the spring and when they took the bill back up again in, in this form with S-352. And they did discuss in Senate appropriations whether it was still appropriate to have this and decided to leave it in. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are various options on this, um, but it, it's all going to be a question of where you want to draw the line. So you could, for example, say benefits for um, than one or two weeks during the eligible period to capture some of the folks who were laid off for a week but otherwise worked, um, or you could strike it all together. Um, but I think no matter what you do short of striking it all together, um, you'll end up excluding some people. And the question is, is there an appropriate line to draw? Um, and I don't know um, if this factors into the estimate that uh, Chloe and Joyce prepared. Chloe could probably weigh in on that more, but that's something else to be cognizant of. Right now, there's a $7 million gap um, when you combine S352 and 353 between what the House has appropriated and what the actual cost is. Dan, is there, um, uh, I, I do, if hospitals laid individuals off for a single week, are there federal dollars that hospitals receive that they could uh, compensate those workers for, you know, for, for any of this hardship? I mean, have, I mean, I've heard that hospitals have, have done some compensation of certain workers. And do we know if this group happens to be one if they were laid off and then brought right back on? Um, so I don't know, um, and I, I don't know enough about the funding we provided to hospitals with the federal dollars. Um, that would really be probably more of a question for Jen Carby, um, although um, the folks from JFO might know too. Um, but yeah, I just, I unfortunately can't really speak to that. Um, I know this is one stream that hospitals can use to get hazard paid in individuals. I just don't know if they're providing any sort of additional pay to individuals who are excluded from this, um, but we're performing the same kind of work, um, or even whether the money we provided can be used for that. And this doesn't need to be the end of the conversation because the Joint Fiscal Committee, based on recommendations, will be looking at any additional uh, ha uh, any additional CRF monies that have not gone out the door and and to understand what this, how many would be within this group of individuals and how not to double dip because we can't, according to the federal guidance, they can't receive both benefits. Um, it may need um, more time and, and could ultimately be um, a later discussion if it's a, if it's a priority from the legislature. Uh, Chip? Um, thank you. Uh, so I'm trying to react to the last thing that you said as well. Um, I, I guess I would just say that I, um, I think Dave's raised an important point. Um, and whether, and one of the questions is whether or not there are other folks, you know, numbers of other folks who fall into the same category. Is it, was it really just hospitals or a hospital that laid off people for a week or are there 
um, other categories of people that were laid off that we really need to try to address. All, all of that leads me to think that I would really love to see our Commerce Committee dig into this a little bit more and, and make a recommendation, but I know but the timing issue is is one we're going to have to deal with. And so whether or not we address that through JFC or um, or try to do something um, in legislation, I, I might have to leave the people who understand the timeline better than I do. I, but I would agree with Mary. I don't. I don't want to drop this issue. It seems like one that we need to um, think about how we're going to address because it does seem patently unfair to me that if people were laid off sim solely for a week, that they wouldn't um, then be eligible for these benefits we're trying to provide to others. And so, um, moving forward and, and knowing the time constraints, uh, Charlie and Stephanie, is this something that your committee would continue to uh, try to dig into so that, I mean, we would have to know what the costs are to this, um, you know, how big is this group? How do we make sure that they, they don't get the benefit for unemployment and for, and for hazard pay? Um, and, and we would need a fiscal note on this. Is this something that you would consider um, digging into and um, providing feedback if it's if we could use the, the route of the Joint Fiscal Committee? Yeah, I, I, I can't speak for the whole committee, but it does make sense to uh, first determine as to how many people could be affected by this. Uh, we could talk to the Agency of Human Services that has been administering the hazard pay program to see in their process, you know, how often they've come across this as well, um, to see if there's any way to determine that. And, knowing that time is of the essence is to figure out how long it would take us to determine that. Um, I don't know, and we'll try to see about with joint fiscal, yeah, because if we can create at least the opportunity, because right now you would be prevented from, I believe in joint fiscal committee from applying, you know, appropriating oh. <laughs> money to folks that don't fall into the definition. So if we can at least uh, expand the definition um, then that gives you the ability to to do that down the road. So yeah, uh, we can discuss it in the committee this morning. Okay, um, Mary. Um, I'd be reluctant to take action in this bill that may expand um, the financial obligation without understanding it. I think it would be interesting if the relevant committees dug into the issue and we could have other vehicles for solving the problem. Um, maybe not just JFC, but there are going to be other vehicles coming through here mm -hmm. where we could take care of, of um, language issues as well as understanding the impact. So we, we need to get this out of committee. Um, and I think there are other ways to address it including the budget that we have a lot of related J, uh, CRFs. Yeah. yeah, that's what I was thinking, yeah. Stephanie? So, uh, just a reminder, so this bill goes, uh, spend, is for the period mid-March to mid-May. So it would be interesting to find out when these layoffs happened at the hospitals and if they happened during this period, time period or after. As I recall, the layoffs were happening um, Sort of towards the end of the initial uh, crisis, um, and then also just a reminder that so if people were laid off, they were able to receive the six hundred dollars additional benefits um, from unemployment insurance. So just a couple of things I think we should keep in mind when we're looking at this a little further. Thank you, Stephanie, for that clarification. Uh, if there's no other questions, I do. Can we continue to move on? I don't see any other questions. And so Damien, do you want to continue? Okay, certainly. Um, so the um, we had already talked about the hours worked as an independent contractor or sole proprietor. Um, and so this is going to be 3A and B here. This language changes in the commerce report. Um, 
what this was was a holdover from earlier language where for former employees, the uh, employer filed the grant and then the state basically said, here's a check and they would have to, they were automatically enrolled and would have to decline um, for a variety of reasons, including that um, the, the employer may not know if they collected unemployment during the the eligible period if they left after, you know, say you worked um, four weeks at full time and then left the employer, um, perhaps they collected unemployment during the period or were otherwise disqualified for some reason. So um, th this uh, is taken out by the, the House Commerce Committee because there's no reason for them to elect not to receive the hazard pay if they're going to be filing an application for the grant anyway. That's kind of their election to opt in rather than opt out. I think I made that a little more jumbled than it needed to be. The program <laughs> is opt in, so there's no reason for them to be informed uh, that they can elect to opt out. Um, this is another piece here that Charlie has talked about. Damien, I just wanted to see if everyone was clear on 3A and B. I do not see any questions, so uh, let's continue. Okay. Seven. Yep, so this is language, that the Senate passed language that said the covered employers may identify potentially eligible employees who are no longer employed. The House Commerce changes to shall. Um, the Senate discussion um, and of course I can't speak for all of the senators, but what was discussed in the discussion were, for example, folks who were dismissed for, for um, uh, and so they were giving discretion to the uh, employer to determine whether or not to identify former employees. Um, the House Commerce Committee has changed that to shall, uh, so that you don't have uh, an issue with employers who say, um, for example, I, I didn't like those employees or I'm angry because they left for a job with better pay and so I'm not going to identify them. Um, so this, this makes, the House would make this obligatory for the employers. Um, it was optional on the Senate version. Um, so this is the way the Senate ended up structuring the, the program to contact former employees, um, which the House has, has largely kept. Um, and so it's basically the program, once they get the contact information for a former employee, will reach out to them, notify them that they may be eligible to obtain a grant. Um, and then, again, the may elect to decline has just been in change to shall inform them that they're not required to apply for the grant. Um, and this gets back to the benefits cliff issue that we discussed in the spring where some folks may choose not to apply for a grant because of tax or benefit implications um, where either their, their marginal tax rate will jump a bracket or um, where they may more likely uh, reach a benefits cliff for something that's important for their family. Um, we've done everything we can in the bill to try to avoid benefits cliff issues, but to the extent that there may still be a benefits cliff issue out there, this gives people the option. Um, and then the grants go out direct from the program as if they were a regular state grant. Folks will get a 1099 miscellaneous at the end of the year. The state does not withhold taxes from this. Um, so they're going to be provided with written notice that the grant may be subject to income tax. And then the final piece here is because we, the state has to do 1099s, um, there's some personally identifiable information here, particularly social security numbers that is going to be collected um, and may be uh, collected by contractors working with the state. So this requires it to be kept confidential and makes it exempt under the Public Records Act. Um, it is likely exempt under the Public Records Act already, um, but this is built for spenders. Um, and then section two, are there any questions on section one before I move on? Um, I am okay. not seeing any hands. 
Great. So section two requires the program to reach out to employers who have already applied for a grant. Um, the Senate version said uh, that they may identify potentially eligible employees. Again, the Commerce Committee has changed that to um, request that they identify potentially eligible employees who are no longer employed by them um, to be consistent with the shall language that they added um, previously. Um, and then Damien, the I am, Damien, I am confused here a bit. Um, the, this, the amendment that is before us at Charlie, um, the, the, the first page of the amendment, have those changes already been reflected in this, in what you're showing us? No, unfortunately, no. this is what passed the Senate. Okay. And then uh, the House Commerce Amendment hasn't been voted on yet. So, okay, so that um, I mean, it's, it's left their here, committee, so. but it hasn't been voted on on the floor. So I don't have a merged version of those bills yet. Okay. Um, the next piece was not changed in the Commerce Committee. Um, and Katie is really better to talk to this piece. This is the, the child care piece. So uh, Katie, are you still with us? I am. Great. Can you, uh, if you just tell me where oh. to go, I'll, I'll scroll there. Sure. Um, let me just start um, with a reminder of what this language was. This section amends um, part of the human services and healthcare CFR bill that was passed in June. There was originally 12 million that was appropriated for three different purposes. And Damien, if you don't mind scrolling down. So you'll see in the existing languages, the three purposes were the restart grants, the parent child centers and for children's integrated services. So what this amendment does is it adds um, an additional category that the 12 million can be used for. And that's a prospective payment to staff employed at child care programs regulated by the Department for Children and Families. Um, and I'm not sure what the committee plans to do today, but Human Services has since um, passed an additional amendment that would remove this language and subdivision B um, and it changes it a bit, it changes it in two ways. First, um, the phrase child care programs regulated by DCF, um, the more that kind of percolated on that, it was a pretty broad term and it could pull in the employees working at hubs, which was not the original intent, com intent coming over from the Senate. So the um, Human Services Committee decided to be specific and replace child care programs with um, family child care homes and center-based uh, child care programs and preschools. Um, so that was one change. And then another change when we were walking through this in human services, I recognized that um, this language that was in the Senate draft was from an earlier amendment I had drafted and not the final amendment I had drafted for um, the Senate uh, Committee on Appropriations. Um, so the Human Services Committee made that correction to use the um, amendment that the Senate Appropriations had meant to offer. And what that amendment does is use the language instead of prospective hazard pay grant program, prospective workforce stabilization program. And it also has a phrase that ties in um, that this money is um, in recognition that persons serving in child care facilities moving forward are exposed to an elevated risk of COVID. So it ties it back into the, to, to um, the, the risk of contracting COVID. And then do you wanna scroll down? Sure. Please. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm muted. Are there any questions uh, on the pieces that Kate went over that have been changed by House Human Services? Okay. Uh, Katie, let's continue. So that's the end of the version that came over from the Senate. If you'd like, um, we can pull down um, this document and I can pull up the human services amendments. You can take a look at that because they also strike through what you're looking at on your screen right, right now is subsection B. Um, they, uh, human services has struck through that language and they have a new subsection B that basically says, 
Um, would you like me to pull that up? Please, yes. Okay. Go ahead, Katie, I made you co-host. Thank you. Okay, so um, at some point I, there's, um, I, I need to walk through what's original, what got amended, what additional asks for amendments are still on the table. I just wanna make sure I know who is um, proposing what amendments and what's coming from House Appropriations. So let's, let's just continue with um, the as amended by House Human Services. They have, they have, they amended sub B and now they've also sub uh, capital B, um, changing the wording of the child care programs. And did they have two instances of amendment, Katie? They did. I'm trying, I pulled up the wrong document. I'm pulling up the correct document now. Okay, so this is the second one for two, um, two B. Right? Correct. Thank you, at the very end. Okay, now I have the right document. Great, let me see if I can share it. Okay, so the first instance of amendment is what I just talked you through. So you'll see here on line nine, we have the language perspective workforce stabilization program. Um, staff employed at family child care homes and center-based programs instead of that more generic child care programs. And then we have language on lines 11 and 12 that has that tie-in with COVID. And then the second instance of amendment, as you see, we're striking through the existing subsection B, um, which really has to do with reporting on appropriations no later than August 18th, 2020. So at this point, that language is um, a little bit irrelevant anyway. Um, and now the new language has a lot of cross references. So maybe I'll just describe it to you more colloquially. Um, basically what this is saying is that any appropriations made pursuant to the new subdivision B on workforce stabilization cannot occur until all the allowable expenses from all the other um, subdivisions in that section, meaning the restart grant, CIS and PCCs have been allocated. So first allocate what you meant to use the money for back in June. And once that has occurred, then um, there can be an appropriation pursuant to the new language for the workforce stabilization program. Okay, we have a question from Diane. Thank, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I don't know, we don't, do we have this document? This is not one that I have, I think. This has got a 4-4 four, four at the end. I can make sure that Teresa has it. This is- okay. um, Yeah, we have the one for that amendment to S352 that's coming from basically commerce. We don't have this one that's coming from human services. Okay, I'll make sure that Teresa has a copy. I'll send it to her right now. Okay, so what we have before us I believe, if I have this correct, we have S-352 as amended by House Human Services. And Charlie, your committee has uh, suggestions for amendment. Is that, Teresa, can I have a full screen so I can see everybody? Thank you. And, and yeah. Charlie, in, in your amendment, are you going to offer on the floor? Or, uh, or yeah. Okay. It, it's yeah from me and others of the members of the commerce committee so we're trying to amend the report then really coming out of uh house human services correct do i have that procedure right i think that's right okay. so what our committee is going to um consider is um the amendment um we're going to consider the the senate bill as amended by house human services and further amended by a group of uh representatives from the commerce committee you got it right. on the floor. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the bill will not be further amended by anyone from commerce. That will be a, a separate position that we take that will be determined on the floor if that becomes part of the bill. Do I have that procedure correct? Yeah, uh, that's what I'm trying to, yeah. That I just that's lost. I'm trying to make sure that I get the wording right that what we're voting on eventually is S-352 as amended by the House Human Services. And then we'll take a position on an amendment, um, further amending the House Human Services by 
the members of commerce. Yeah, right. That's how I understand it. Okay, and my um, my next question is then the, the 2.5 million for the expanded eligibility and technical corrections in this bill. Charlie, does that cover everybody in, that, that is in your expanded language as well? Yes, uh, so we met with uh, Joint Fiscal Office and Chloe provided us with a spreadsheet and estimations that they had made based on different professions that were covered in there, so yes. Um, so in the underlying bill, the two and a half million uh, covers any changes that you make to the language? Yes. Okay, thank you. Kimberly, uh, Katie, I know that you have to go. Are there any final questions for Katie? She needs to leave for an appointment. Does anyone uh, have any? Actually, this is somewhat relevant. If I could, Madam Chair, just sure. jump in. Um, I, Diane, I'm just listening to uh, how you characterize it. And it is the case that human services amended S-352, and they have one more piece that they inadvertently overlooked, and they asked that appropriations add in one more piece, and that is the language that Katie first had up before she circled back to the human services. So there is one more step of amending along that path, and I don't know if we want to uh, have Katie uh, cover that before she has to leave. Yes, we do. And do have time, Katie, to quickly do the one, there's one further suggestion that sure. we should bring to our committee to consider. Thank you. Yes, I'll pull it up. There we go. Um, so this language shows you that subsection B again about the prospective workforce stabilization program. It strikes out human services version and it adds this new language. And what this does is it adds a category of child care providers who would be eligible. So we still have um, department regulated family child care homes in the center based programs. And this adds after school programs that are not otherwise serving as the school age child care hubs. So this language amends the human services amendment in that one way. So the, uh, the, the 2B, no, this is uh, just uh, subsection B was amended, and this is a recommendation to our committee that further amends their own amendment. Is that correct, Katie? Yes, uh, I drafted this as an amendment um, coming from this committee. Yes. Um, right. So I drafted as an appropriations committee amendment. Yes, they, because they had already passed out the bill. There was a, a group that was left out. And so this is an amendment that Kimberly has been working with the Committee of Jurisdiction on um, for us to consider to further amend the bill from House Appropriations. Okay, are there to include the child care centers and um, as Katie just related, are there any questions for Katie on this further amendment that, that Kimberly uh, will propose for our committee to consider as our own amendment? Boy, we have a lot of amendments flying around here. Okay, Katie, I think we're yeah, set. Gonna, yeah, it's all going to be about the wording and which one we do yeah. first. But I'm going to try to keep it very simple. But I need Teresa to make sure I'm getting this right, too. Okay, so Katie, I think you're good because I know you have a time crunch. So thank you very much for coming in. The first thing we do with S352 is um, we have the Senate version of the bill before us um, that has been further amended by House Human Services. Are there questions for Damien on any of the pieces that he went over? We do have uh, the one piece that Dave brought up that uh, Mary and Chip have both spoken to uh, that we're going to ask for additional information and. Uh, and look for a different vehicle if it's an area that we need to go to. Are we all agreeing upon that, that, that piece? That this, due to timing, that holding it for that piece, it, it may be, it will be better if, if we can address, if we need to address it and should address it, we would find a different vehicle for it to um, travel on. Are we comfortable with that? I see one hand up. I see a couple. Dave, are you? This was your concern. Okay. And we're going to ask the Commerce Committee to do some work on that. Linda, you will follow that. And Dave, I know it's important to you, so make sure you're following along with Linda on that and Chip and Mary. 
Um, so are there any other questions outside of that piece that this committee would like to consider? So if there's no questions there, before we vote on um, this, Kimberly would like to bring an amendment forth on behalf of our whole committee for us to consider adding to the bill. And it's the piece, Kimberly, it's the one that, um, Katie, was it Katie that was just here? Yes. Okay, thank you. The Katie, Teresa, do you want to put that up again? And Kimberly, do you want to offer it for consideration? Yeah, just uh, sure. a second, and I just sent it to the committee. Thank you. So, Katie, are we going to vote on each one of these separately or as a whole? We're, we have to amend. We're, Kimberly is going no. to bring forth for us to amend the bill. So we would vote on amending the bill, and then we will vote on the bill as amended by Human Services and further amended by House Appropriations. And then we're going to take up uh, Charlie's amendment and take a position on that. So it's first is Kimberly's. Right. And then is passed the Senate and further amended by House Cobb. But Charlie's will be on the floor. Uh, and so. Yeah, but they, but they did amend it first, but Charlie's got another one, right? Yeah. They did not amend it. Okay. Correct. House Correct. Commerce did not amend it. Okay, it's amended by House. Okay, Human. and um, I just had a, a reminder before, um, let's do this amendment and then uh, let's go through the, uh, the 250, uh, no, the $2.5 million additional costs. Kimberly, do you want to? Uh, sure, sure. So um, the, the two pieces as Katie just walked us through, it, it was essentially a recognition after human services had voted that there are some after school programs who are not hubs and they were inadvertently left out. So if you look at lines 11 and 12, the words that say and after school programs that are not otherwise serving as school age childcare hubs, though that is the missing piece and that is the added language into the work that human services did. And this is um, just sort of uh, capturing that group. And I, I did uh, make a quick phone call to the folks uh, who run the after school program. And I said, you know, give me an example. What, are, what is the group? And she pointed to a, a group, an organization that runs One Planet. And this is out of uh, the South Royalton Tunbridge area. And apparently, they run a program for elementary age children where the, the kids don't have remote learning. And when they have an early release at 1 p.m., they can then go to the one planet for the uh, one to five slot till they get picked up um, by a parent or guardian. So this captures that. Thank you, Kimberly. Any questions for Kimberly? Um, and before we vote on this amendment and then vote on the bill, um, I'd like to walk through the money piece. Mary? And it's just one of language. It's, uh, you're describing this as simply adding those after school programs, but the language, you know, talks about a workforce stabilization program. It, 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 the language it, shifted, Mary. They originally, I mean, it's a little strange because the title still references hazard pay for frontline employees or something like that. But the preferred terminology, I don't know if you recall when Katie talked about um, some errors that were made along the way, that now the, the terminology is the one before us, which is the workforce stabilization program. That's that's the language. And I, th I think based on my very cursory, okay. you know, inquiries, this all happened yesterday. <laughs> so then scrambling on a, a number of things. And um, I don't think it's a large universe that frankly is going to be captured in that. So I don't think that there are fiscal implications. I okay, mean, I could stand you. to be corrected, but that's my, yeah. that's my current understanding. Well, we'll learn from well, maybe we won't. Um, I, it's just the language is so different from what we were seeing, but this is just an evolution in how we are describing essentially the same cohort of people, except we're adding in the after school gang. 
That's right. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. Okay, and uh, Chloe, uh, could you walk through the $2.5 million that, um, that our committee will really be focused on, the additional money that's needed for this bill? Uh, sure, I'd be happy that to. Here? That's why that yeah, you, that's why I'm here. You and Joyce, you and Joyce. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> oh, is Joyce here as well? That's great. No, no I don't see her. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, as the bill originally, so we are also a little bit confused about the order of events. But as the bill came over from uh, the Senate, they added, and I, I did provide a, a fiscal note to Teresa this morning that walks through the appropriations um, that relate to this whole program it, across both bills. But so as the bill originally came over from the Senate, um, they it was essentially technical corrections that added um, a number of employee categories that AHS, when they were administering the program through experience, recognized had been um, left out of the program. Those included um, contract uh, janitorial staff and food service um, and uh, 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 hotels and motels that were serving homeless um, individuals who are temporarily, temporarily housed there. So we made an estimate on the number of employees that we believed would be covered by um, those technical corrections. And we, estimate, we estimated that it's gonna be about another 1,500 employees at a cost of approximately 2.5 million. Okay, uh, are there any questions for Chloe? Um, Thank you, sweetie. I'm gonna open up that. Screen. Chloe, did I jump in too oh. quickly or did you need to? No, I, I, um, that's it. <laughs> this one, this part was, uh, once we know the employees that we're looking to include, um, it's, it's easier for us to calculate the estimate. So this is fine. Oh, that's the other any questions for Chloe on that calculation? I'm not seeing any. Okay, thank you, Chloe. No and problem. Um, before Charlie, I'm sorry to keep you here so long, but we can't address your amendment until we, uh, until we agree to a bill. And so um, I would entertain a motion if there's no questions or clarification needed from either the Commerce Committee or uh, Legislative Council or Joint Fiscal Office. Uh, Mary, are you, do you have a question? Or? Yeah, no, I, I'm just trying to find the fiscal note. And I, is that all rolled into the one? Yeah, yeah that's what, it's both. There's one fiscal okay. note that says, has both bill numbers on it. Okay, so I've yes, got I right put every one. I put okay. everything in one fiscal note um, since it's all amending the same program. Um, and so this way you can see the total appropriation that's gonna end up going to the program after these two amendments. Okay. And so then it's on the second page that you describe the technical corrections and the 2.1, okay, a uh, 2.5. 2.5, yes. I wanted to make sure I was reading the right thing. Thank you. No, thank you for reading it. <laughs> okay, um, so the, the first thing that we need to do is to the House Appropriations Committee, if we're going to amend the bill as Kimberly has walked through. Um, yep. Kimberly, would you like to offer an amendment? Sure, so I would um, propose that we uh, do amend the uh, S352 as drafted in version 1.1 1 .1, uh, to include the after-school programs that are not otherwise serving as school age childcare hubs. Okay. So would that read, Madam Chair, like move to report favorably the amendment to S3 52 as presented by Representative Jessup? Uh, yes, uh, to 352, um, uh, Teresa, help me here. Do we include as amended by House Human Services yet or not? So not yet. So you're just not amending okay. the right. bill right now. Okay. And uh, Diane, I would just use the uh, draft number of what I okay. just sent you. All right, that. Okay, is there a second? Uh, made a seconds. 
So the, um, the motion has been made and seconded to for House Appropriations Committee to amend S352 um, as, as dated and, and numbered on the version. Uh, Diane, can you give us that version number, please? I've got draft number 1.1. .1. Thank you. And simply including uh, the language around uh, the including child care centers. Any final questions or clarification needed? Because there's a lot of moving pieces here. I need to print this one. Okay, if not, the clerk uh, shall call the roll, please. This is on the amendment. My pleasure, on the amendment. So, Representative Conquest. Yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer. Yes. Representative Myers. Is she here? Linda, you're muted. Linda? Uh, she's, she's oh. she can't unmute. She has. Um, we see she's saying yes and a thumbs up. Teresa, is that legal on Zoom? Uh, she really should say yes. All right now, no. I, it finally came up. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Representative Townsend. Yes. Representative Yacovoni. Yes. Representative Toll. Yes. Great. So this is on the amendment. Yes. It's 1100. Thank you, Diane. And now I would entertain a motion um, to vote favorably on S352 as amended by House Human Services and further amended by House Appropriations. Right. Yep. Got it. Diane, would you like to offer an amendment? I'd, I'd like to make, uh, yeah, I'd like to offer a motion that we report favorably on S352 uh, as amended by House Human Services and further amended by House uh, Appropriations Committee. Is there a second? Uh, the motion has been seconded by Representative Myers. And is there any further questions or clarification needed? Uh, if not, um, I would ask that the clerk call the roll. Representative Conquest. Yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer. Yes. Representative Myers. Yes. Representative Townsend. Yes. Representative Yacovoni. Yes. Representative Toll. Yes. Okay, that's 11 zero, zero. And um, this bill uh, will, our, the uh, House appropriation votes uh, will be um, the human services amendment. I would like Kimberly to report that out. And Linda, I would like you to report out the bill. It's, it's kind of split in two areas. Are we, are we good with that? Um, okay. And then um, the questions, uh, obviously, you know, we can talk to the 2.5 million, but the questions would really go back to the Commerce Committee on the floor of the House. And so now. Can I just make a suggestion that we, um, for the clerk's purpose, we'll say Representative Myers is the reporter of the bill okay. and that she can ask to um, send questions to Representative Jessup when you get to the uh, that section. Okay. If questions come up, then you could always yield, Linda, if they're directly related to human services, because Kimberly was in the committee, um, or uh, we may choose to send them right to the human services committee. So um, Representative Myers, I will be sending the please. email to the clerk right now. Um, if you could reply all and Representative Lamper will reply all with the vote. Great. And are we not, we're not going to do um, 
Charlie's yet? Uh, no, we're now we're circling around to where we started, Charlie, and I'm sorry, now we're going to come back to your floor amendment that we're going, we'll consider now. Teresa, would you just put the floor amendment up so everyone is, is clear with the floor amendment by representatives from the Commerce Committee, and there's a couple of changes. On 352 or 353? That was in 352, Charlie, right? Yes. Yes, 352. Damien, do you want to do it? Are you yeah, I can do it. Okay. I think it's pretty quick. I think we've seen it once. Be. Okay, so here's the amendment um, from the committee. So the first edition, uh, which Representative Kimball mentioned already is the traveling nurse agency or other nurse staffing service um, that provided nurses to a healthcare facility or a residential care facility during the eligible period. Uh, and then the next change here is to provide consistency. Uh, you may remember that during in the initial bill that passed in the spring, uh, we allowed employees at home health agencies and nursing homes to exceed the $25 an hour limit. Um, so this would allow the traveling nurses and contract nurses to also exceed that limit. Uh, there was a question earlier about um, the issue with uh, traveling nurses or contract nurses where uh, the, the facility pays the contract nurse employer um, and then the nurse, that contracting employer pays the actual traveling nurse, contract nurse who comes in. What we're really looking at here is the way the bill is set up. You are not allowed to withhold or charge a fee for acquiring, for getting the grant. The only thing you can withhold are uh, any applicable taxes that are due from either to be withheld from the employee's paycheck or that the employer has to pay. So um, if I'm traveling nurse agency um, A, and I've, I've uh, provided these nurses to healthcare facility B, healthcare facility B will pay me and I pay the traveling nurses, but then the traveling nurse agency actually applies for the grant for its nurses who are employed there and then passes the grant through to them after withholding applicable taxes. So there will there are no fees that are allowed to be withheld and that's expressed in the bill. Um, and then the other changes here are all around um, the just cleaning up the hazard pay language for former employees. Uh, in the first one here, the third instance of amendment at the top of the page here, We've gotten rid of the language saying that an individual may elect not to receive because they can just choose not to apply. Um, the fourth instance of amendment, we've made it obligatory for employers to identify former employees. So the word may has been struck and replaced with the word shall. The fifth instance of amendment here um, just changes the language so that notice to potentially eligible former employees um, doesn't inform them that they can elect not to receive it. It just informs them that they're not required to apply for a grant. Um, and the final instance of amendment here is instead of telling employers who have already submitted applications to the program that they can that they may identify former employees, it's requesting that they do identify those former employees. So those, those are the changes there. Thank you. So there's six instance, instances of amendments. Are there any uh, questions <clears throat> or clarification for either Damien or for the Committee of Jurisdiction? We have uh, Charlie or Stephanie here. No questions. Are we ready to take a position on this amendment that we will hear on the floor? Dave. <coughs> Thank you. Um, it's not clear to me, I'm sorry to open up a whole new area of, uh, of discussion, but I'm not sure if the train's leaving the station and this will be covered in S353, but there's some confusion in my mind around EMS workers. 
I thought there was a lot of noise, forgive me for characterizing it that, that way. I thought there was a lot of concern initially back in June that we helped some EMS staff, I think the private people, but, but not the, it wasn't so clear, the municipal or the volunteer. My understanding was that a municipality um, through their uh, CRF assistance could choose to help their EMS workers. But, but um, I was left with the impression that there's a, lot, there's, a, there's a volunteer network that plays a large role in our first responders and that they've been excluded. Can somebody help uh, educate me, please? I'm not being critical. I'm just trying to find out what, if anything, we're doing for those folks. Thank you. Sure, there's, okay, go ahead, Damien. Yeah, there, there's three funding streams at work here. Um, so the first one in this bill, um, you're correct, uh, is for, would be for a private EMS service. Um, and then the municipal uh, CRF funding bill uh, expressly allows those uh, municipalities to use the funding for hazard pay, but it, it comes down to, um, it's something the municipalities can choose whether or not to do with that CRF funding. Um, and uh, the, what's, what's not clear to me at this point, and as we were starting the session, those funds were just starting to roll out, is the extent to which municipalities are aware of that or, or are actually using those funds for that. There's a third stream of funding. Um, we set aside $3 million for, um, I can't remember which agency at AHS to, to provide to EMS providers. Uh, 1 million, I believe, was set aside for training. And then the remaining 2 million um, could be doled out for various other things, including hazard pay. Again, it's not clear to me to the extent to which that is actually being used for hazard pay for the municipal services, which include the volunteer and the professional services. So, um, most of the volunteer EMS and volunteer fire are considered to be part of a municipal service. Um, and there, there are only a few that are private services. Um, and I, I do have some more detailed written material on that that I've prepared with uh, Tucker Anderson, who's our municipal attorney, that I can send out to the committee just explaining the breakdown, but I think one of the things here is that the other funding streams were not dedicated to hazard pay, so they may be being used for other municipal or EMS needs, whether that's PPE or um, other sort of, uh, and I, forgive me, it's it's been a long week, so I'm having trouble thinking of other needs, but but other needs that are, are eligible for CRF dollars, and they may not be being funneled towards hazard pay. And Damien, I, I believe that, um, our, I, I hope this isn't two different municipality money that I'm talking, pots of money, but there was CRF dollars out to the municipalities that did not get used in the amount, in the time limit that it had. And I believe that the Senate has, is extending that period of time. Would that open it up for these groups of EMS workers? Because those dollars did not all go out the door. I think significant amount left? Uh, that's a good question, and I'm just not sure. Um, I haven't been working on that bill, um, so I, I just don't know um, what's happening with those funds. Okay. Madam Chair, are you talking about the money that was set aside for municipalities in case the schools didn't provide them with their funding? No, that's a different, no. different it, set. It, okay. it, it, it was a different set of money uh, that wasn't that ultimately what didn't end up being needed and um, yeah. but there was a, a, a there was a different pot of money that went out for COVID related expenses and yeah. really, um, a fraction of it was used but they, they were bumping up against their deadline to uh, apply for the money and I believe this it was a September early September deadline and I believe it's in a Senate bill that will bump that out until October. Um, uh, let's see, Damien, can you, would you or Maria help us uh, figure that piece out? Um, because if the money is there and, it, and they didn't apply for it, 
then this provides the opportunity. As you said, there's three funding streams, the first one being for the privates in this bill, but the municipal money or the 3 million within AHS that's available. Um, uh, Dave, yeah, I just, I just okay. emailed Tucker to see if he can give me an answer on that and I'll okay. pass it on to the committee when I hear back. Thank you. Um, Chip and then Mary. Uh, just a quick question maybe for Charlie. Um, I appreciate the fact that the bill makes sure that the money for the traveling nurses goes to them and not to the employment agency. Um, but was there any discussion or concern in your committee that um, if all the employment agency might get out of it is the opportunity to withhold payroll taxes if they wouldn't bother applying for the for the hazard pay? Um, I'd have to say that we didn't discuss whether or not they would be motivated to um, to apply for that, except that their employees would be pushing them to apply for it. So there's they don't get any extra money for it, but so we didn't discuss that um, really. Yeah, uh, hopefully the marketplace will take care of it. Okay, thanks, Teresa. I mean uh, Mary. Um, just the observation that JFO should be able to tell us if there's money left in this pot and what the subscription has been to that. So I don't know if Chloe has insight or Maria has insight. I think Ma Maria is working on it. I, okay. I, yeah. I, I yeah we, we actually just uh, got word from Karen Horn, who's listening in on uh, today on our, our discussion today. And um, the information she provided is that town applied for 9.1 of the $12.6 million. Um, she's looking into how much was used for hazard pay, but the tax department did extend the deadline to October 1st for applications. Okay, so, um... Um, I, what I believe that we can do, we can act on this amendment as it does address uh, three avenues toward EMS workers. And then Dave, uh, we do have a period of time before this would come to the floor if we um, feel it's not addressed. But um, out of the 12.6 for municipalities, Damien, how much has been spent? Uh, I believe 9.1 is what uh, Karen uh, yeah, she says that towns have applied for 9.1. So I don't know how much of that has actually been issued. Obviously, for applied for an amount um, paid out could be different. Um, but yeah, and then they their deadline is is two weeks out at this point. Um, and, and so so that does leave 3.5 million for consideration for municipalities for. Um, for um, those EMS workers, as well as is the full three million still available within um, HS that that could be included in this as a as that another I, funding stream? Yeah, that I don't know. Um, I I'm aware of that money being available, um, but of that money, only two of the three million could actually be put towards uh, uses including hazard pay. One was specifically set aside for, I believe, training um, for uh, personnel to, to deal with um, COVID-19. So training them on safe practices and so forth. Okay, so we will uh, get in touch with Sarah Clark. Uh, she, Maria, do you have time to shoot Sarah a quick email and ask her out of 3 million and the 2 million that would, that would be available how much of it has gone out for hazard pay and how much would be available. Um, I don't know if, if she's listening. I don't think Adam can weigh in on this, uh, but Sarah- uh, I can send an, I will send Sarah an email. So uh, what my question is, before I ask my question, Dave, you have one? Thank you for your patience. I just wanted to ask Damien a question on this and you may not recall. Um, regarding the EMS, do you know if they have to meet the same 68 hour standard in order to, to break that threshold to get assistance or is it uh, much more flexible? So uh, the 
the 68 hour standard only applies to the private EMS services who wouldn't be covered in the, the municipal funding. Um, so the private EMS services who are covered by this bill um, the, would have to meet the 68 hour threshold. If you're a municipal EMS, that's up to your municipality to determine. Um, with many volunteer services, uh, the okay. way it's done is either on a, a lump sum stipend or a per call stipend. Um, as long as the stipend is not equivalent to what you would pay in a professional uh, firefighter or EMS worker. Um, okay, thank and you. Volunteer staff. Yep. So, yeah. It's, thank you very much. Yep. Thank you, Katie. Yeah. Thank you. So um, um, my question for the committee is, uh, are you ready to take a position on this amendment, um, knowing that we can have another bite at the apple as we learn what is available through the two streams, through AHS and through um, the municipal uh, pot of money that has gone out? Are, are we comfortable taking <clears throat> a position on this amendment? Okay, um, Diane? Oh, I'm sorry, I was getting ready for you, Madam Chair. I'd like to make a motion that we report favorably on the amendment to S352 as presented by Representative Kimball and all. Uh, thank you, Diane. Is there a second? I'll second. The motion has been made and seconded. Are there any other questions or concerns regarding the amendment um, as presented by members from the Human Services Com no, Commerce Committee? If not, I'd ask the clerk to please call the roll. Representative Conquest. Yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer. Yes. Representative Myers. Yes. Representative Townsend. Yes. Representative Iacovoni. Yes. Representative Toll. Yes. <laughs> it's 11-0. Thank you. And Linda, uh, this will be <laughs> to report out. Thank you. OK, now we're a little late, but that was a little more complicated than I uh, thought it would end up being. There were a lot of moving pieces. So let's move it right to S353. And uh, we have Damien here to continue to help um, uh, Legislative Council's presence. We also have Representative Jerome for the Committee of Jurisdiction. And Chloe, you are the JFO person as well for this one. I am. Thank you. No problem. Um, so Stephanie, did you want to start with some opening remarks and then turn it to Damien or? Sure, I'll say, uh, let, me, let me just give a sort of a broad summary of what's going on with this uh, bill. So it's S353 and it is an act relating to expanding the frontline employees hazard pay grant program. And we've amended the bill slightly. That, so, uh, Again, the, the bill is from mid-March to mid-May, and it's to cover um, employees that work for a covered employer. Um, and they, they must satisfy the, uh, that they are working within a, an elevated risk of COVID-19. <laughs> uh, they're performing 68 hours of work. Uh, they would uh, receive the $1,200 and those who work between 68 to 216 hours would uh, receive $2,000. Um, so currently the program in 352 uh, covers, uh, provides funding for healthcare and human service employees who were dedicated to um, responding and to mitigating uh, work with the in the virus. And uh, let me just go over the expanded employee employee employment categories. So it would be for those people, uh, employees who work in grocery stores, pharmacies, um, essential retailers who were, were listed within the governor's stay at home and stay safe orders, such as hardware stores and food and beverage stores, 
agricultural and feed stores. Also, wholesale distributors uh, who are making delivered deliveries to these to these retail establishments, as well as trash collection, waste management, and septic services. Privately owned and operated water pollution and control facilities. Child care facilities that provided care to the children of essential workers. Uh, vocational rehab providers, funeral and crematory establishments and security services that provided security guards to the covered employers. Um, let's see. So initially we didn't, we were cautious uh, about expanding the employee categories because we were worried that they wouldn't be covered within, within the uh, CARES Act and worried that they, we would have to uh, return funds if, if we had uh, covered this large, larger group of employ employees. But now uh, Pennsylvania has included this group within their, um, within their guidance, um, within their bill. And um, it does not look like in the Sierra funding now that the, the, uh, pri these private sectors workers would be prohibited um, within the CRF guidance. And I think that is about it. We have a, we provided, a, we would like appropriation of twelve and a half million dollars for uh, this expanded list of employee employment under S three fifty three. Are there any questions? I'm sorry, I was muted. So the and a half million for the expanded group. Did the Senate, the Senate had expanded this group as well, right? They did. And um, oh, yeah, Madam they, Chair, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I'm finding it so hard to hear you, Representative. Oh, I'm sorry. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I'm so sorry. Okay. I just want to make so sure that I hear your answer. Do you want me to go through the list of, employ of, oh. of covered employees again? No, I so, was tracking on the paper, but I want to make sure I can hear your answer. Okay, yeah. So what I need to understand, um, Stephanie, is the, the 12 and a half million, the total, the total cost, um, we set aside 15 million in the budget for the hazard pay bill. Uh, my understanding is that the full cost for the hazard pay bill is 22 million. And, and so where does this 12 and a half fit within the 22 million? It's not above the 22, is it? I'm hoping. Uh, no, no. I, I could, about I no. I mean, it was because we believe that we had uh, allocated from the speaker and through the uh, priorities of the house, $15 million to allocate to this. So it's two and a half million from 352 and 12 and a half from 353. Right. Okay, so that is, that's, that, that, that is our 15 million for both of those bills. And what that 15 million does, it would, it would make this a first come first serve. This is the full expanded uh, bill. The 15 million is what the house had set aside. And in order to fully cover all of that expanded categories, category, the full amount would be the 22, Charlie, even with the amendment that your committee uh, yes, I believe it was, I believe it was uh, not 22, Stephanie, help me out with that, it was two and a half and then 17 and a half, was it 20? So two and a half and 12 and a half. It, it was 22. 15. 22, and okay. Who was in the Senate, right. 22, yeah. 22 okay. and a half came from the Senate and we, and we want, and we, our, our amount was 15. Okay. So that uh, committee members are following uh, the the total cost are both of the bills put together two fifty two and two fifty three the two and a half we just um, this one um, be, because the house had passed a bill allowing only fifteen allowing fifteen million dollars for hazard pay house commerce had 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 agreed to the language that is in this bill but it would mean that it would become a first come first serve because the total between the bills would be at 15 million to fully pay for uh, those that we believe who are eligible. It comes at a $22 million cost. So we're, we're 7 million uh, apart. But I asked um, Steve and I think Steve just joined us and I know we have Maria here too and I don't know which of you are talking about this. 
uh, talking to us about this, I had asked uh, um, the Joint Fiscal Office to look at what CRF money is available as more spending goes out the door or, or issues that have come up. Is there any more flexibility within CRF? And Steve, do you want to talk to our committee or Maria? I don't know who uh, from the Joint Fiscal uh, Office or if it's Chloe who's speaking to this. I can do it. I can do it unless Maria wants it. I, Maria, you want me to do this or? Yeah, yeah, you go ahead. Yeah, okay. So the um, so the Senate did find you know they had other CRF money use things and you can consider one is that um, some small things like the um, Housing Conservation Board said they weren't going to use 1.75 million of their money um, there was 300 thousand dollars that the Defender General wasn't going to use of his money that's about two million by itself they also took two million out of the uh, joint fiscal um, 150 million set aside, which gave them basically a total of $4 million to help meet their needs. And the big the big change um, that the Senate did, um, they did two, two big things. The big one is um, in June, we gave 275 million to the uh, provider uh, for provider funding in AHS. And the way AHS is doing that, they're doing it in two, uh, payments. One payment has already occurred. The other one will occur in October uh, based on the, the months prior to that. And the first payment went out and it was, it totaled a hundred million dollars. And so the second payment, uh, a lot of those providers, the number one, one of the number one users was dentists who were basically not working at the time. And um, they are probably working. And so even if you estimate another $100 million of payments. And even if you estimate another $150 million of payments, the, the 275 number is probably overstated. So the Senate basically used 20, I think in total about 28 million of that, um, or maybe 29. What they did is they gave the um, AHS more authority to use money for testing and, and nursing homes. They gave, um, and testing and other, <coughs> excuse me, facilities. Then they also, uh, move some costs into the AHS um, that funding line uh, for um, providers. And I think, uh, and I, Maria can talk about that when we get to that area. And then they took out 25 million to cover sort of CRF needs, and a lot of that money wow. went to meet the need of the um, the fully fund the um, hazard pay bill and bring the 15 up to 22. And then another huge chunk of that money went to increased funding for K through 12 education because the data has come back showing that uh, the number, and it isn't 32 million, it's more like 53 million of need right now. So they funded the full need um, that was identified and there's a chart on that we can go into later. Thank you, Steve. So when the budget left the house, there were some unknowns that we didn't have. We didn't, um, um, the, the 1.7 million from BHCB uh, we were we were hoping that the they would be able to do the the full four million additional in projects and I think it was just I can't remember if it was yesterday or the day before we did receive a letter from Gus saying that they're not going to be able to use the four the full four million the Defender General uh, that that wasn't eligible uh, money that could be used and so that freed up the three hundred that Steve talked about there is um, some. Uh, of the four million left at the joint fiscal office, we did know about that, but we did we did not touch that, not knowing what future needs would be. And then uh, when we made our decision on the budget, we um, we did not move or uh, make take a position on the provider, the funding to providers through AHS. There appears to be some significant capacity. So what I would ask the committee now is we're going, we're going, we have the Senate's version of the budget. Do does this committee want to take a position and add seven million from this additional pot um, for hazard pay and um, and 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 pay the full costs? Um, or do we want to leave it at the 15 million and make it a first come, first serve? Um, because that's the money that we had to work with when we passed it out. If we decide to do the full amount, um, we, we would have to note that when we go in to do the budget, 
that that we have already you know we've already made a decision on seven million of that pot of money that is left of CRF. So let's have some discussion now um, about uh, the position that the committee would like to take on um, hazard pay, using you, you know making this this decision now, which will you know impact some of our decisions that we make later. Any thoughts? Well, Madam Chair, I can I can start if it's, that's okay. okay. Yes, so sir. I'm I'm given given the information that was you know the amount and we're very very careful not only just to how we spend our CF money but tracking our CF money to see where there are pockets of small amounts and large amounts that are able to be retooled and placed in a place where we had priorities that we feel like we can get it out the door. I am very, very comfortable with taking, because from where it's coming from are not places where we are um, robbing Peter to pay Paul. So yes, I'm very comfortable with this. Thank you, Diane. Um, Charlie, did you wanna speak? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I realize I'm not a member of the committee, but I just wanted, if, if we had to live with a smaller dollar amount, things that we talked about is do you decrease the amount of the benefit going out to the potential recipients? Do you carve out uh, some people and say, no, you don't get it? Uh, or uh, so those were some things that we discussed. So uh, knowing that you would be able to find money, we made neither of those recommendations. So I just wanted to let you know that we considered other options as to how to extend that money to cover everybody that might be included in that program. Okay, thank you, Charlie. And depending on what our committee decides, we, you know, if we decide to fully fund, then then we don't have to make those accommodations. And if we decide to do 15 or a number in between, uh, then, then we'll open that conversation. Uh, Peter? Thank you. I'm fine with the 22 million. In other words, adding 7 million now. The funds will go out immediately and thus, and thus um, you know, we won't have to worry about scooping them back on the 20th of December and trying to reallocate to somebody else. Uh, people will spend them in our local economy and that will, uh, that will help the locals. Uh, there's a lot of good reasons to do this. I'm fine with doing it now. Thank you, Peter. And Stephanie, we'll go back up to the Commerce Committee. I see your hand is up. Thank you. I just wanted to note that the $28 million that for the uh, first hazard pay program has nearly been completely spent and the applications, um, the final applications are under review. So it will be totally uh, spent by the end uh, very shortly. Thank you. That's important to know. Um, Linda. Well, I think that what we're looking at and the people that we're looking at, I think we have to really, I feel like we need to go all in for, for, for those people. Um, those people have been handling what we have been sitting here, not been able to handle. And so I really feel that it's important that we go for the full 7 million into this, into this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, Schiff? Um, I was going to speak up in support of this. I don't think I need to say much more than has already been said. I, I just, you know, for me, it's really, Charlie brought up the potential. So if we didn't do this, we'd have to consider how else we're going to deal with it and um, making those kinds of um, either reductions in pay or saying that it's on a first come first serve basis. Um, particularly for this group that we're trying to serve just does not seem like um, uh, the way I want to go. And I don't think it's the way the legislature wants to go. I mean, I think my impression is that we've all been um, really supportive of trying to make sure that people who have been serving for modern during this and, and taking the risks should, should be getting the uh, consideration about, of hazard pay. And so um, I wouldn't want to have to make those kinds of decisions about reducing the amounts or the or deciding who didn't get it. So I'm a long-winded way of saying I'm just supportive of what everybody else is saying here. Let's do it. Thank you, Chip. <clears throat> um, I have Kimberly and uh, Maida, Dave. Uh, two words: long overdue. 
Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, Maida and then Dave. Yes. No, thank you. Um, I, I think my questions have been answered. I just want to double, double check that if we go with the 22 million, we are effectively fully funding this effort and that all workers, all of the um, frontline workers uh, uh, who have been mentioned as this discussion has gone on, that they will be covered and will be fully covered uh, as stipulated within the bills. Yes? I am looking for a nod from uh, JFO from Chloe or Steve. Chloe can answer that better than me. But yes. I yeah. Yes. Thank you. That's all I needed to have reassurance on. Thank you. To the best of our estimates, yes. <laughs> that, that's always important. These are these are all estimates. So, but yes, that's the intent. Uh, Dave. Uh, I'm cautiously supportive um, uh, to the degree to which we may be taking money from the healthcare stabilization fund, the 275 million, because 100 million went out and, and presumably another in October is going out and it leaves some money left over. I'm, I'm reluctant not seeing a spreadsheet, not seeing any data on, on who received money from AHS, who might have asked for money, who, who might not have, who might have got less than what they asked for. Now, all of that may be fine, um, but I'm trusting um, that it is, and I'm reluctant to do that. Maybe if, if uh, Maria or somebody could at least get a spreadsheet uh, from Sarah at AHS, just so we could, we could see that and know that. I'm on a board and I'm not advocating for a local provider, but I, I happen to be on a board of directors for a nursing home. And, and um, boy, just hearing about uh, reduced admissions, um, taking beds offline um, because of COVID, et cetera, that industry is just like our childcare industry. If you don't support the infrastructure, when, you, when we come out of this, it won't be there. Or it's very fragile with all of the acute pressures they have. Now, maybe all of that has been well addressed uh, by the stabilization funds, but I'm not sure. And I'm not sure how volatile the situation is. That's one point. My other point that um, I don't know if everybody's going to apply for this. We might think that they will apply for it. We would hope an employer would, et cetera. But I, feel, I do feel comfortable that if there's money left over, correct me if I'm wrong, Madam Chair, we have a fail-safe in December, whereby the unspent money can go to the UI fund and cover our, our state commitment there. So that makes me comfortable that we won't be sending anything back if indeed, you know, AHS got it more than right, et cetera. And when I say AHS getting it right, that, that's not meant to be um, unkind that they might not. It's just I, I'm, I sometimes am cautious in this committee <laughs> and, and that's, that's all. So. If, if we could at least get a spreadsheet, and I, I don't want to hold things up, I'll look it over, et cetera. Does that make, make sense? Am I? It, it does make sense. I just want to remind you, Thank Dave, you. of the seven million that's needed, five is covered in other areas. So it would be just two million out of the 275 yep. million because we have the little, we have 1.7 from BHCB and the 300 from the Defender General the 200, uh, I mean, the 2 million from, uh, from the Joint Fiscal Committee. And so that's a total of 5 million that we can identify. And, and to make it whole, um, it would be 2 million out of the 275. So the question to you is, uh, we can ask Sarah Clark to come in and to give us um, a, a rundown out of that 100 million and who was addressed. And if the total 175 will be needed in addition, or if we're comfortable um, taking any of that to, uh, to address the final 2 million here and to address um, any unused amounts to go out to public schools. Uh, th thank you. I don't think I listened as well. When I, he I heard a number 28 million and I started scribbling and wasn't listening, um, no. I think if it's just 2 million, fine. I don't, yeah. I don't think there's any need to hold up uh, with Sarah testifying. Well, the 28 million we're going to want to, because that was the larger, the 25 that the Senate is proposing 
to do other things within the budget. And so that would be, a, you know, a, a further budget discussion. And I think most of that went okay. to through 12. So we could have Sarah in for that larger discussion so that we fully understand the availability of those dollars. Madam Chair, I wasn't sure if this was helpful. So you sent this. Uh, page, page, page seven page is the six, one we need. Page seven or page six? Seven. I'm sorry. Yeah, I made a mistake. Just to give you a sense of where the money went. Uh, okay. Actually, there you go. So the 98.7 is what went out. Um, and you can see the types of beneficiaries where that first 98.7 went out on this sheet. Um, hospitals got 65 million. And then there's a list uh, following this in the document. And, they, and Teresa could send you this. This was what was given out in the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. Um, but I think it's a good idea to have Sarah come and talk about it. Thank you, Steve. So um, my question is for Dave and for the members, um, are we comfortable moving uh, with the seven, uh, the full seven million to make hazard pay whole? Um, or do we want to make an adjustment in between? The, the larger conversation will be when we do the budget uh, on, on um, whether th th we can accommodate 25 million out of that pot. But there's still 2 million that we would need to take from here now. Uh, Mary? I propose that we add the entire amount necessary to make the hazard pay program whole. I'll second that. Okay, so there's a motion on the floor um, to uh, add the entire amount to make the hazard pay whole. Uh, I do want to remind the committee, I don't think we've walked through the, we did the highlights of the bill, but we didn't do the actual walkthrough of the bill with Damien, unless my mind, is my mind, did I, did I miss this? And I, I don't believe we did the walkthrough, Damien, is that correct? No. So no walkthrough, yeah. Let's just take a position on the money at this point, and, and then let's do a walkthrough of the bill, and, and then we'll take a vote. So there, um, there's a motion on the floor to, uh, to consider the full 22 million uh, after we have, you know, depending on the walkthrough of the bill. Um, is there any other questions or comments? This is just going to be a raise of hands. Uh, those of you that support that, please raise your hand in the committee. And those of you that are opposed, I need a verbal no, please. Okay, so we have tentatively agreed to the 22 million. Damien, could we do a quick walkthrough? We had the highlights of the expanded employment categories and for the time period um, and the money that is needed, but I, our committee does need to look at the bill. And Marty, do you have a question? I'm sorry, or was that a hand up? For the vote. Hand up for the vote. I had a hand up for the vote. Okay, thank you. Okay, Teresa, would you put the bill up or Damien and we can do that. Walk through. Yep. So um, this is the committee's <laughs> amendment here. I'm not going to put up the underlying bill because they're they're very similar and I think it would just get too confusing. Okay. So the uh, what the amendment does is it strikes out um, the first section of the Senate bill and just puts in a brand new first section. Um, so the, the first changes here, just technical changes in the opening introductory paragraph because we're expanding it to other essential frontline employees, not just the health, safety, and human services. Um, the next change is here are, and uh, just as Representative Jerome summarized, we're adding in the retailers that were open during the stay home, stay safe order. Um, so these are your grocery store, pharmacy, food and beverage, hardware, agricultural supplies, et cetera. Um, we're adding in the wholesale distributors making deliveries to those retailers, trash collection, waste management, and septic services. Uh, operators of privately owned uh, water pollution abatement and control facilities. Um, and an important thing to note here, so this is, for example, Global Foundries operates its own uh, water pollution control facility, which includes both industrial wastewater and domestic wastewater. 
Uh, and so the key is, is that they found COVID-19 in facilities at this point, um, because it goes straight from uh, your sink and down the pipe. So this would be for uh, industrial operators that treat both their industrial wastewater and their domestic wastewater together. So there's an elevated risk of exposure to COVID-19. Uh, childcare facilities that were providing childcare services to essential workers during the stay home, stay safe order. Vocational rehabilitation providers to the extent that they were providing rehab services in person. Funeral establishments and crematory establishments. And then this last one here uh, is the security services agencies. They're licensed under Title 26. Uh, they would have been providing crowd control, uh, direction to people, controlling entrances to facilities that are closed off, et cetera. I see a question. Mary? Well, I was gonna wait till you took a breath, but um, <laughs> you're, you, you, in the wastewater description, you cited industrial and you were quite specific. I assume this covers any privately owned wastewater because there, there are other wastewater treatment providers who are not industrial. Is that correct? Yeah, so we've, we've covered both the septic services, which would uh, service like a community septic or an individual septic uh, service. And it's, it's worth noting that they weren't providing regular service during this period, but they were providing emergency service. So if you had a system that was failing or overflowing, they would service that and expose themselves to potential uh, exposure to the virus. And then these water pollution abatement and control facilities are facilities that are similar to the municipal right. um, uh, sewage treatment facility that you're familiar with. Um, important thing is, is that this is something that's going to be treating uh, sewage, not, uh, not just industrial waste. The one that was mentioned to us um, from ANR as their best, the example that jumped to mind first was Global Foundries, but they mentioned that there are several others around the city that treat our private facilities that treat sewage, um, domestic wastewater. Um, so yeah, it's not necessarily just in, uh, mixed industrial and domestic wastewater. It could be any privately operated or privately owned and operated water pollution control facility. Okay, thank you, Damien. Thank you, Mary. Um, yep. Mary, do you have a follow-up or can we continue? I think we can continue, Damien. Okay, so the, the rest of this is strike through of the conditional language that the Senate had added um, at the end of June, which would have put back in these private sector frontline workers. Uh, if the guidance under the CARES Act changed um, or if there was a new federal funding stream. So it's worth noting that the guidance under the CARES Act I, I would not say that it's been expanded, which was the requirement in the bill. It has changed, um, and, but it's still not explicit on this issue of private hazard pay. So what's happened since we ended in June is Pennsylvania passed a prospective hazard pay program, very similar to ours, except it was for the fall rather than the spring, um, that covered uh, grocery store and pharmacy workers and a number of other private sector essential workers who weren't health safety or human services workers. Um, Louisiana also provided a hazard pay tax rebate to those that same group of workers. And then subsequent to that, at the beginning of September, the Treasury Department updated its guidance. It relaxed some of the wording around hazard pay, saying that hazard pay um, it struck wording that said it had to be for healthcare, human services, um, public safety, et cetera, and just said that it had to be for a hazard specifically related to COVID-19. And then all of the other language around it was related to the public sector workforce, basically saying that you couldn't provide hazard pay to all, for example, 
state employees who continued uh, working at the office during the pandemic, you had to limit it to those uh, state employees who actually had an elevated risk related to COVID-19. Um, and it did not uh, provide any further limitations on the private use. So the way I read that is it's still not 100% clear, but it's moved us down the continuum of risk um, from something where I felt uncomfortable saying that we could safely do it without a clawback to something where I feel still not 100% comfortable, but more comfortable saying that um, it appears like the federal government is not um, tying our hands. And then the backup to all of this is our requirements are that it's consistent with federal guidance. So if the guidance changes, AHS can always limit the use of those funds um, going forward. So that language is already in the authorizing language for the bill. So we have a couple fail safes here. So I think we've moved down that continuum of risk to a lower risk proposition if we add these employees in. Thank you, Damien. Uh, Teresa, can we have the full screen again? Oh, oh, I can stop the share here. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Um, and so this, this as, as uh, Damien formally walked through, were the highlights that, that Stephanie had brought to our attention. And the 19.5 is, is the full amount for this bill. Um, House Commerce did um, um, the 12.5 because of the amount we had in the budget. And then the other 2.5 is in the bill that we had just passed that travels. So um, we would need, if we're going to change the amount back to the full amount, we'd need a formal um, uh, motion on the floor to amend um, the bill as amended by House, Com House Commerce. Would someone like to make that motion? Mary? Or Maida? I'm, I'm, Mary? Yeah. Mary? I was try, trying to raise my hand. Yeah, thank you. So I move that we um, increase the appropriation in this bill to $19.5 million, knowing that we have the other, you know, so we were talking about a total need of 21, uh, 22 million. Um, knowing that we have the 2.5 and the other bill that we discussed, um, so we need to add 19.5 here. So my motion is that we appropriate nine, a total of 19.5 to this bill. Is there a second? Um, we have a second from Meta. And so uh, the motion has been made and seconded for a total of 19.5 million to be reflected in this bill creating a full 22 million for hazard pay between the two bills. Any final, any final questions or comments? Uh, if not, um, Diane, this is a House Appropriation Committee amendment to um, have the bill reflect a total of 19.5 million. And I would ask that you call the roll, please. Sorry, Madam Chair, I had to step away. Who first and second? I didn't catch it. Uh, Mary made the Mary. motion, seconded by Meta. Okay, great. Be the reporter. Okay, so this is a motion to um, make sure that the bill has the 19.5. It's a, an, a, an amendment from the House Appropriations Committee. Okay. Representative Conquest. Yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer. Yes. Representative Myers. Yes. Representative Townsend. Yes. Representative Iacovoni. Yes. Representative Toll. Yes. Okay. Damien, will you be drafting that amendment and sending it to me and I will initiate I, the uh, email to the clerk and CC you? Yeah, I just drafted the amendment and sent it to our editors. Um, it would basically just strike out the second instance of amendment in the House Commerce Report. 
So the, the amount of funding would stay at the 19 and a half million full funding. Um, I'll let you know when I've got it. Great, thank you. Thank you, Damien, so much. Thank you, Stephanie, for coming in. Chloe, thank you for the, the fiscal pieces. And um, Commerce Committee, thank you. Oh, Charlie, you're here too. Are you still here? I'm looking around the squares. Everyone keeps jumping. Uh, thank you to your committee for the work that you've done. And this took a little bit longer than we had anticipated, but I really wanted to walk through the pieces so that we were really clear who was doing what and, and why the changes had happened. So thank you. Uh, committee I'm sure your committee is very thorough. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you, <laughs> thank you for fully funding. Yeah. And uh, Linda, you have your hand raised? Yeah, Did I didn't hear who was gonna report this. Mary is no, or you. me? This is you. That's what I thought. Okay. It's you. And Representative uh, Myers, I'm creating the email now that you can reply to. Okay. Thank you. And Maida, your hand was up. Uh, yes. D so we do not need to vote on 353 as amended by Commerce right. and further amended by Appropriations? Didn't we, we just do that? No, we just amended oh, it. We just did the amendment. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thank you, Maida. I'm like, did I miss something? I had already <laughs> checked it off. I'm moving ahead to the next agenda item. Okay. <laughs> now we're not, but I saved the space for it. Thank you, Diane. And so now we are ready for the final step. Uh, Diane, uh, would you like to make a motion? I would like to make, make a motion that we report favorably on S353 as amended by House Commerce and further amended by House Appropriations. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Uh, the motion's been made and seconded. Are there any final questions or comments? Uh, if not, uh, the clerk shall call the roll. It would be my pleasure. Representative Conquest. Yes. Representative Fagan. Yes. Representative Feltis. Yes. Representative Helm. Yes. Representative Hooper. Yes. Representative Jessup. Yes. Representative Lanfer, yes. Representative Myers, yes. Representative Townsend, yes. Representative Yacovoni, yes. Representative Toll, yes. All right, that's on a vote of 11 0 0. And this is all being reported by Representative Myers, correct? Yes, thank you. All right, I will learn not to check things off before we actually complete them. So thank you, thank you everybody. And we're going to take a five minute break uh, now, or maybe let's- I think I just did. <laughs> we are going to come back and actually be working at quarter after. Uh, we, I think um, Teresa, Maria can do a quick over CRF differences. There's not many, but there is the question that we would like to have Sarah Clark come in and talk to us about. So the other pieces, I think that it's a, a pretty straightforward just for informational purposes. And, 11, and at 11, we have Representative Copeland Hans is coming in to do S-124. Uh, we don't actually have it, but we're going to take the testimony in advance of receiving the bill. So see everybody at 11.15. Um, Grab um, something to drink, a cup of coffee and something to eat. I'm gonna go. Thank you.